Well, good day everybody, this is Joe. Hey, uh, recently I got me a set of glasses, spectacles, from an online supplier who is not sponsoring this video at all, but uh, anyways, when I got the glasses in, they came packaged in this little black box. And uh, of course, you know, I'm a pinhole photographer from way back, and the first thing I noticed was there's a little fabric loop, a little pull loop, and pulling it out, of course, opens up the box like that. But the first thing I thought of is this would make a great pinhole camera. And I think it's not going to take that much work to turn it into a pinhole camera. Hey, let's try it, shall we? One of the things that I noticed about this box immediately was the fact that the outer box itself is enclosed on all sides except the side here. And it's black inside already, so that makes it already almost ideally suited for a camera. I think I'm going to put the pinhole and the shutter mechanism right on the middle of the side here. And then really the only work we have to do is to the insert. Now the insert has some white light colored cardboard on the back. We'll have to either paint that or put a piece of black construction paper in there to kind of shield it from uh, fogging uh, due to that. And uh, the little pull thing is very handy to remove the inner box from the outer room. But you can see the problem here, of course, is a light leak. If we have photo paper in here just like that, that's going to not be uh, work well. So there's several ways we can get around this. So one of the ways we could do it is we could put a black construction paper baffle right over the front about a third of the way over, enough to where it's not going to interfere with the angle of view of the pinhole but enough to where light coming in at this angle will be blocked from fogging the paper. That's one way of doing it. The other way would be to build a little sleeve that fits over this part of the camera out of black paper and gaffer's tape, and I might do that. That might actually be a better idea, and the reason why I say that is because I don't know how much clearance there's going to be between this edge under here to tape using gaffer's tape to tape a baffle in front of here. It might end up over time as you work the camera, it might end up causing the tape to peel off and whatever. So I think I'm just going to build a little craft paper, black paper baffle that fits over here and uh, see what happens. Okay, let's see what kind of a film format we have if we just put the paper in the bottom of the box. It's going to be about six and three quarters by two and a half. Let's say two and a half by six and three quarters. Now we could also make a curved film plane and that would be probably closer to eight inches. I'd have to test it with a strip of paper. But if that's the case then you could cut strips from an eight by ten inch piece of photo paper that are two and a half inches wide and what's nice about it is you can get four of those from a 10 inch long piece of paper. So you could make four negatives from an 8 by 10 without any waste if that's uh, if we can do the 8 inch side curved. Okay, I happen to have a scrap of photo paper. This is a uh, test strip and it's two and a half by eight approximately. Yeah, two and a half by eight. And uh, so when I slip it in here, it looks like it's going to actually work really well. Now I would expect um, our pinhole, uh, we're not going to get the full image all the way out to the edge just because that would be essentially 180 degrees. We're not going to have that wide of an angle. But this will give us uh, a fairly even exposure along the middle two-thirds of the uh, paper negative. Okay, now uh, one of the things we have to figure out before we start making our pinholes, we have to figure out what the size pinhole we're going to make, and it's based upon the focal length of the camera. The challenge with these kind of ultra-wide angle cameras is deciding what is the focal length of the camera, because if you measure the focal length from the middle, it's about an inch and three quarters, but if you measure it out to the corner, it's like four inches. The challenge is if you optimize the exposure for the short focal ratio of the center of the camera, then you'll end up underexposing the corners. And on the other hand, if you make the, if you define the focal ratio of the camera as being like four inches, uh, fairly long, you're going to end up having to give it more exposure 
and to optimize the exposure for the edges and corners you end up overexposing the center of the image so uh, what I have to do is come up with an with a happy median and I typically will split the difference between the shortest part of the focal length perpendicular to the center of the paper versus the edge or the corner uh, out here somewhere and so uh, it'll be a happy medium and hopefully the dynamic range of the paper will be able to take up the slack there. It'll be slightly overexposed in the middle, slightly darker on the very edges, but it'll be a happy medium. I've been talking thus far about the focal length of the camera in inches, but actually whenever I'm making pinhole cameras I'm always going to be using metric because my pinhole is measured in fractions of a millimeter and so obviously you want to measure your focal length in fractions of a millimeter also so you know what the focal ratio is when you do the math. So the uh, shortest part of the focal length from the center is going to be uh, 45 millimeters and if you measure it out from the center to the corner it's going to be a hundred millimeters and if you take the average of that it's going to be basically about seventy two and a half roughly millimeter focal length nominal and so I'm going to calculate this as about a seventy millimeter focal length just to make it simple and so then I have to figure out how big of a pinhole do I need for a 70 millimeter focal length. You can go online and there are various resources for calculating the pinhole size. Uh, Mr. Pinhole Calculator is one of them. I like to go and refer to my old book by Eric Renner, the famed pinhole photography artist and uh, he has in the back of his book a chart that makes it real handy just to pull the book out and refer to the chart. Now I happen to have the first printing of Eric Renner's book on pinhole photography rediscovering a historic technique and uh, this was published in 1995. There's a second edition or second version of this, an updated version, but I actually bought mine I think in 1995 because there's a, there's a receipt from Camera Works, a camera store in Albuquerque, it's not even there anymore, and it's uh, dated May of 95. Anyways, <clears throat> so going to near the back of the book where my notes are, and we refer to a 70 millimeter focal length tells me that my pinhole needs to be about a 0.3 millimeter diameter for somewhere around F226, approximately F220 or so. So I'm gonna to have to make a pinhole about 0.3 millimeters in diameter. I think it's worth mentioning at this point that some people who first get into pinhole photography are too hung up on the math part of it. They think that you have to be precise and exact, optimize the pinhole size for the focal length, to, otherwise it just won't work. And the truth of the matter is, what's much more important than optimizing the pinhole size is using as large of a film format as you can. That will get you much better results in terms of sharpness, if that's your goal, than trying to optimize the pinhole. Any hole will make a, a, an image. It's just the way optics works. And if you get anywhere close to the optimal size, it's gonna be pretty good. Another thing that's important is the quality of the pinhole. The roundness of it, make sure there's no burrs hanging in the hole, and make sure it's thin. I'm using a really thin metal. I'm using uh, two mil, uh, which is .002 inch thick sheet brass, but uh, I usually dimple it down so it's thinner before I poke the, the hole through with a needle. And so I'm gonna go ahead and start making my pinhole. Usually, if I'm trying to target a specific diameter, it'll take me a several tries. So I might have several pinholes that aren't quite the right size. Okay, the essential things I need for making a pinhole. First of all, I need a millimeter scale, and this one is very thin thickness-wise, so it's good for measuring the size of the pinhole. I need a magnifying loop of some kind, like that. Uh, I'm going to need a sewing needle. Now I have a little kit one of these little kits of needles and I put one of the needles in a wine bottle cork and that's my little tool for drilling it and a thin piece of cardboard that I do the hole in, a piece of 400 weight emery cloth and the sheet brass itself. <laughs> so I've been using for the last 15 years or so I've been using this roll of two mil thick sheet brass. This was out of some craft store years ago, but uh, it's getting down there. I'm going to have to end up buying some more. So I just cut, we're going to try, I'll cut two pieces. These are about 
roughly a half inch square. Okay, in order for you to see this, I'm going to have to switch lenses. So this is my little 7 Artisans 25 millimeter, which is equivalent to a 50, but the important thing is it goes really close focus. Like that. Okay, let's get the camera pointed down here and we can start this process. There's a natural curl to this uh, metal, and so I'm going to dimple it. That's one thing I didn't mention to you. You're going to need a little punch or something like a, a nail that you can use as a punch. The idea is I want to put a dimple in the middle of it, and I'm going to use just a little hammer. And uh, the idea is not to poke through, but to just dimple it like that. Just a raised dimple. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put it dimple side down on my cardboard and I'm going to take my little needle and try to center it right on the dimple and apply just a little bit of force. I'm going to turn the needle and just apply a little bit of force and I'm going to try to very slightly break through the tip of the dimple and the idea is not to break through too largely and I'm going to have to examine this under my loop and it's not quite there, but what I'm going to do is when I get close, like I think I am, I'm going to put the, the dimple side down on a piece of emery and wet my finger, and I'm going to do figure eights on this dimple against the emery cloth, and the idea is for it to slowly sand down the tip of the dimple to break through. Ah, there we go. Now, let's see. We do have light. It's very, very small, however. There's a very tiny hole and it needs to be sanded out some more. Put it on the cardboard and again put the needle into the hole but I'm going to very lightly press it. I don't want to waller the hole out too large. If you make it too large then you've gone too far with it. So I've pushed out some of the burrs and now dimple side down, wet my finger. Again figure eights on a piece of emery stop it and re-examine it under the loop and then repeat the process until you think you're about at the right size now I have to measure it and the way I do this is I take my millimeter scale put the piece of brass behind the scale dimple side pointing toward you and you want to line up the dimple with one of the lines on the millimeter scale and then you want to measure how many diameters you can fit between well, from one line to the next line and it looks like on this one I've already gone too too big it's almost a half a millimeter this try it looks like it's pretty close let's see if I can get a loop in here you basically want to start measuring the pinhole uh, from one side of one of those lines and then slide it over one two three plus a little bit more to get to the same side of the next line, how many diameters will fit into one of those lines. So it looks like about three and a half diameters will fit into one of those millimeter lines. So then if you go one divided by 3.5, you get just about 0.3 millimeters, which is what we we're looking for. So about three and a half diameters to fit in a millimeter. And you can not only measure the size of the pinhole, but you can gauge its quality, how round it is. And on the convex side, you want to make sure the dimple is sanded down. See, that's nice and flat. Okay, the next thing I want to do is to measure, find the center of the box lid. <laughs> There is my center right at the the fork in the Y. Okay, so I want to uh, cut a kind of a rectangular hole around this for the pinhole to show through because the film format is longer this way than it is this way. So looking relative to the size of the letters, I don't want to cut all the way out to the edge of the U and the D. So I'll probably cut to the middle of the U in the middle of the D like that and that'll get me a little bit of room on this piece of brass to tape it so it still will be sealed up. I'm going to tape the piece of brass from the inside so um, I'm going to make the opening about as tall as the letters are 
and about as wide from here to here. And I'll just use an X-Acto knife, move my pinhole away here. So let me uh, start on the corners. So what I want to do is I want to clean up this edge. And I'm also going to want to darken the edge once it's cleaned up. I want to darken the edge with a black permanent marker. Now one way to test to see whether this opening is wide enough is to put something light colored like this scrap of photo paper in the camera. And then viewing from the middle of the, of the opening, tilt the camera until you can see the edge of the box. If you can see the edge of the box, it means you can get all the way to the edge of the film format. See right there the edge? So we can hit the top and the bottom. Okay, I have a permanent marker here and now I want to start darkening the cross section of the cardboard. And you can also um, put the marker in from the side and get it in there and try to hit the bottom edge. Okay, now to attach the pinhole, it'll be attached to the inside of the box. About an inch and a half to two inches, something like that. The secret to making the hole is you fold the tape in half, adhesive side out, and in that middle crease, you're going to snip a tiny little snip that's a 45 degree angle, and then another one at 45 the other way, and what you've made is a diamond shaped hole in the tape. There's several ways of doing this, but I basically, because the, the brass is curved anyways, it sits on this curved tape really good. And you can take this other piece of tape and carefully center up the pinhole. There's a piece of glue, actually, in the middle of this tape I want to get off. Okay. Center up that diamond on the pinhole. Something like that. And I'm actually holding the piece of tape by the the end that will be going into the pinhole into the box first and I'm going to slip it in like this. There's my pinhole and it's taped up inside. As I indicated earlier with the curved film plane the paper is going to come up all the way up toward the front edge and you can see so this is where it would be with a flat film plane the the edge of the image but it goes all the way up to like as far as about here almost before it gets cut off. So we're going to get pretty much the entire curved film plane illuminated. Okay, now let's go to the problem of the inside of the box. So we have this light colored cardboard in the back that might uh, present a problem with fogging of light. Uh, I'm going to use some black craft paper to make a liner for it, but also what happens sometimes with these box cameras and you have a piece of photo paper recessed inside of a box, what you'll find sometimes in the darkroom it's hard to remove that piece of paper occasionally, especially if it was a flat film plane and the, car and the paper was in the back of the box. So when I make my little cardboard baffle to cover up this light colored back, I'm going to make it so there's a little handle that you can grab a hold of to help you pull the paper negative out and it'll serve two functions. My little baffle now is made. I have these triangular pieces on the corner that stiffen it and uh, provide a little ridge for the paper to stay positioned at. Okay, so it's important that I measure the end dimensions accurately and allow for just a little bit of looseness so this this little sleeve will slip off easy but won't fall off too easy.
much. eyeball this. Let's see what we got here. Okay. This is going to be my tripod mount on the bottom of the camera. So this is a good place to put some weight on it. And while this wood glue is drying you want to make sure you get the excess glue on the inside of this thing. Make sure you get it off because that will form a hard little edge that will keep your shutter from sliding properly. Okay, so this is a piece of self-adhesive vinyl you can use it for shelf liners, you can use it for making graphic arts. It's this stuff. It comes in these sheets. Okay, this is the real pull shutter. Like that. Okay, so you want to make sure that you blacken all the edges including inside the shutter opening and everywhere like that. And so then I'm going to glue this guy on here. And it's snug enough that you don't need to pull the shutter all the way out. It'll hold itself in place. Well, here we are. We are making an exposure with the camera. The first exposure. As far as my exposure, I metered it with incident metering at f220. That calculates to roughly 4.8 minutes, which is about roughly 4 minutes and 50 seconds, let's say. The Paper negative is in this canister and it fits almost perfectly in here. So I'm going to do rotary processing using 100 milliliters of chemistry. Two minutes. All right. Developer goes back in the cup. We put a little water rinse. I do water rinses between all the steps because it helps to preserve the life of the fixer in the stop bath. Pump it out in a little spare bucket. Stop bath. All the stop bath does is change the pH from base to acid. Stops the development process. Pour it in the stop bath cup. A little bit of a rinse to rinse some of the stop bath out before we put it in the fix. And pour out the water in my little container here. And the fix. And we will fix for two minutes. Okay, fixing is almost done. And I usually do a couple little brief rinses of water. Okay. Let's see what we get here. <clears throat> well, hey, there's an image. Let's see what we got here. You notice how nicely the paper negative fits in this developing tank? See that? Okay. Oh, interesting, yes. 
Hey, that's pretty cool. First light on the new camera. Well, I hope you guys got inspiration from this project to make your own pinhole cameras. I wanted to show you how easy it is if you find the right kind of container, like this little package that my eyeglasses came in, this little box. It seemed immediate as soon as I saw it hey, this is going to be a good pinhole camera box. And sure enough, it didn't take all that much work. You know, you need a few critical tools. Gaffer's tape is really important. A razor knife, a straight edge, a few things like that. It doesn't really take all that much to do. But it's so much fun, and a little camera like this is really rewarding. Uh, they're a lot of fun to make. And over the years, of course, I've made a lot of these cameras. I have a whole collection of boxes like this, different sizes. Uh, so this is what happens when you're a dedicated pinhole photographer. You end up making a bunch of little cameras. Well, hope this gave you guys some ideas to make your own cameras. And until next time, you guys have yourselves a great day.